Ader God, you are amazing. We thank you. We praise your name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning and happy Sabbath. What a joy it is to praise the Lord Almighty, the Creator God. Amen? If you are joining us for the first time here today, I want to extend a special welcome. We are in the middle, or the second week, of a sermon series called Stewards, where the central idea is that all the earth is the Lord's and everything that's in it. All the world is God's and everything that's in it. Amen? And we are thinking through what these words mean in different aspects of our lives. So last week, we thought through what it meant to proclaim all the world is God's and everything that's in it in regards to our finances and to our money. Next week, we're going to think about what does it mean to say all the world is God's and everything that's in it in regard to our relationships with each other. This week, this week, we're going to be thinking about what does it mean to say all the world is God's and everything that's in it in regard to creation and the fact that God created us. As we've been talking through this series, we thought about what motivates us, our motivating vision, and we used these words from last week. From the story in Matthew of a parable that Jesus tells at the end of the parable of good stewardship, the master comes back and says to those he left in charge, well done, my good and faithful servant. And so we've been thinking about what does it look like? Don't you want those words spoken to you, amen? Well done, my good and faithful servant. What would it take for Jesus to look at that, to look at us and say these words, well done, well done. I want to make a note here that there's a difference between striving for God to look at us and say, well done, my good and faithful servant, and striving for God to love us. There is a difference here. God's love for us comes first. There is nothing we need to do for God to love us. God created us. God redeemed us. God loves us deeply. But God has also invited us to partner with God on a mission. And we want to do that mission well. And so that is what we're thinking about as we think about this question of what would it look like for us to be partners in God's mission and for him to look at us at the end and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So as I mentioned last week, we talked about our finances. Next week, we'll talk about our relationships. This week, creation. Do you have a favorite spot where you can go and look at the night sky and see it glorious like this? I remember when I was growing up, I I would go outside my front porch and look out on the night sky, and we could see stars. It was an amazing thing. I actually can see a couple more here than I could in in Riverside. I couldn't see a single star. And when I thought I did, it was a plane that went by. (laughs) But you go out to a place like Joshua Tree, and you look up at the night sky, and you are in awe of the Creator God. The Bible is full, full of passages about the relationship of God's creation to God as creator. It's a theme that that runs through scripture, and last week we actually noted a couple of these when we were thinking about all the world's gods and everything that's in it. And we're gonna look a little bit more today, but, but I'm actually going to talk about two 
distinct pieces of this idea of creation today. The first, all creation praises its creator, but there's two areas. The first is that the creator God created us, our bodies, us as humans. We are his creation. And what does it mean to be good stewards of this creation that God has created? And the second is that we are part of a big creation that God has created. And what does it mean to be good stewards of this creation? For some of you, what we will share today will be somewhat well known. If you've grown up in the Adventist church, you'll, you'll hear some pieces that that are part of our Adventist tradition. Um, if you are new and have not been part of our Adventist faith tradition for, for a long time or, or, or brand new, Adventists are actually often known for their attention to health. Potentially you might have heard this. You, if you meet an Adventist, when I was teaching, um, I was teaching a class at uh, La Sierra University to a group of students, none of whom had met Adventists before. This was their first encounter. And I asked them what they had heard about Adventists. And there was a couple things that they knew. Um, one was the Sabbath, and one was vegetarian. They said, you guys don't eat meat, do you? And I said, well, as a whole, many of us don't. You guys, you guys are those, those people who, who care about health, aren't you? You have the hospital, don't you? Well, yes, actually, we have, we have many hospitals. Adventists for a long time, from, from our early pioneers, have been concerned about what we can do to provide health and healing and care to people. And this has showed up in several ways from the Adventist story. It shows up in medical work. We have over 500 healthcare facilities around the world. We've got some ones in California. This is one in Glendale in California. We've got one in Loma Linda in California, which was uh, right near where I used to live. And now we have one that was right here doing ministry for the past 100 years in our corner. And I have a connection to the medical work um, that Adventists have done because some of you met my grandfather on my father's side last Thanksgiving, but my grandfather on my mother's side, um, who is no longer with us, he was a medical doctor um, in Malawi, Malamula. And a couple years ago, I was able to go there for the first time. And I was able to hear some of the stories of people who he had helped provide health for. There was a story of one woman who had been in, in a very difficult labor and he got word and he was in another part of the country but he, he was a pilot, he jumped on his plane, he came back and this woman spoke to me, his granddaughter, saying, your grandfather saved my life. And there's something about being part of that legacy that is deep in this church's DNA. There's also how many of you here have heard about our focus on health as part of our church's story has gotten the attention of some people who, are, who have no other connections to Adventism. Has anyone heard of the Blue Zone stories? Blue Zones? Just a couple. Just a couple of you. The Blue Zones was a man by the name of Dan Butner who wanted to go around the world looking for places where people lived the longest, healthiest lives. And he identified just a couple of hot spots, I think it might have just been five, around the world, where people tended to live to a hundred or more, and when they were a hundred, they tended to be healthy and happy and here 
on Sabbath mornings. And so he went to the different places and he said, what do you do? Why is it that this group here is living longer than the general population and, and what can we learn from it? And he wrote these books, The Blue Zones and The Blue Zones Kitchen, where he's got recipes that were given from various groups, including Adventists, for what would it look like to live in ways that would help us live long, fruitful lives. So if you are a visitor or a guest today, you will discover that in the Adventist tradition, in our faith tradition, you'll find that paying attention to our health is an important part of understanding our faith. And, and we've got many people in our faith tradition who's written a lot about this. And the questions that you might have is why? Why is it so important to care about this body as God's creation? There is a lot to say here. There's a lot that we could discuss as always. The Bible is full of different references, but we're just gonna focus on one part here. We as Adventists say it's important to take care of your body because it's created by God and it is good and God has given it to us to be stewards of. God created this and so we are to honor God by taking care of our bodies. In scripture, there's a beautiful passage, Psalms 139, where David, who is, who is writing these psalms down, writes this praise to God. He says, for you created in my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Over the years, I spent some time working with um, a group, a small group for tween girls that were about the age between 11 and 13, 14. And let me tell you, this is not something that the majority of them feel. When they look in the mirror and they think to themselves, Oh, I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. You know, this, this celebration of the fact that God has knit us together and made this body has not always been part of the Christian story. In the history of Christianity, the broader Christianity, in some strands, it got influenced by... Greek thought, and it basically became this idea that the world is broken up into two parts, the physical, material world, and the spiritual world that no one can see. And the idea that came in from Greek thought was that everything that was material was bad, and only the spiritual world was good. And what this meant was that sometimes it made people willing to treat their bodies really poorly or treat other bodies really poorly. They would say, torture the body, save the soul. Bodies don't matter. Who cares how we treat them? The most important thing is that our souls get saved. And so they would, they would treat the body poorly. On the other hand, on the other side of the, spe the, the um, pendulum, are those who said, my body is my own, and it's for my enjoyment, and I get to do whatever I want with my body because I want to enjoy it on the other side of the pendulum. For a long time, Adventists have said, when we go back and read scripture, there is something here people of faith that you need to hear. 
Our bodies and our souls and our spirits and our hearts are not separate. They are one. They are all God's handiwork, and we are to treat them well to honor God. We live in a fallen world, and so we will be impacted by diseases and heartache. This is not to say that if you or someone you love has been impacted by a disease, that we're not honoring God. We are in a broken world. But the idea is this. Everything is God's. Everything is God's. So that includes your body. I was doing, I was leading a, a um, Sabbath school lesson in a fifth and sixth grade class, and the lesson was on the image of God. And uh, one of the fifth and sixth grade boys said, oh great, this is going to tell me about how wonderful I am and how, how I'm made in the image of God, and I, I love this. And the lesson actually was, because all of us are made in the image of God, and all of us are stewards of God's image, how we treat our bodies should be reflecting and honoring God. How we care for our bodies in whatever way we can in this broken, fallen world, our primary concept is how, how do we use this to glorify you, God? So this is the central question if you wonder. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So those of you who might sometimes look in the mirror and hate yourselves, you don't get to because you were made in the image of God. Caring for our bodies. One of our pioneers, Ellen White, says the question for us is not what will the world say, but how shall I, claiming to be a Christian, treat the habitation God has given me? Speaking on the body. If the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, how do I treat that well? We care for our bodies because they are God's, made in the image of God for the glory of God. The same thread goes through to the idea of all of creation. God created the whole world. It is all God's. Just like we can't say our soul is good, our bodies are bad, they're not separate. We can't say humans good, creation bad, God creates it all. Humans were created to praise God, creation was created to praise God, God created it all, cares about it all, is planning on redeeming it all. We are just God's stewards. It was interesting, this, this topic of caring for the environment is one that's being discussed much more vigorously now than it was 15 or 20 years ago. And it's a topic, interestingly, of particular interest to those who are younger. There was a, a study, a Gallup study, that said that care for the environment or fear around the environment um, for those who are age 55 or over, only about 56% are really concerned. For those age 18 to 34, 70% are really concerned. And so I, I heard this and I thought, maybe I will chat to some of our youth under 18, so I don't know what the percentage is on that, about, about this topic. And so I had a conversation with one of our youth, and I, and I said, and I asked, um, what do you, do you think about caring for the environment? And uh, are you worried about it? Are you concerned? What are your thoughts? And she said, yes, I think about it a lot. I am concerned about it a lot. And I said, do you want the church to talk about this? And she said, yes, I want the church to talk about a lot of things. And I said, why? And she said, because we as youth are making decisions all the time. 
And I want to make decisions based on what the Bible has to say about it. I want more clarity on what the Bible says. And I think in some of these conversations, everybody, as we're having lots of different topics, we want clarity on Scripture. And so, Scripture has a lot to say on this. Let's start with the very first verse in the Bible. Genesis 1. And you'll see this going throughout the entire Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you start with this beautiful creation story, a comforting, gorgeous creation story that this world is not by chance. God created it with a purpose, and God was delighted in it. God looked at it and said, oh, this is good. And then later in the story, we hear this part, this relationship of humanity to God and to creation. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. This is part of that initial story. But it's a part that sometimes... I think, has gotten some Christians in trouble. Because some have said, looking at this verse, the story is that God created the animals and the earth mainly for us, to use however we want, because we rule. The challenge with this is that if you continue to read Scripture, The universe isn't about us. Creation isn't about us. You read through scripture, it's all about God. It is all about God. God is at the center, not humans. Creation is here to glorify God, and it's intimately connected with his dwelling place. We see kind of strong language about the fact that this is God's dwelling place in numbers. And I'm just going to go through, again, we're just doing a, a broad sweep through some of these passages because we're looking as an overview. But in numbers it says, Therefore do not defile the land in which you inhabit, in the midst of which I dwell. For I, the Lord, dwell among the children of Israel. The heavens in Psalms declare the glory of God. Have you seen them? The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. All the earth worships God and sings praises to his name. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. The Lord's home reaches up to the heavens, while its foundation is on the earth. He draws up water from the oceans and pours it down as rain on the land. The Lord is his name. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the fields will clap their hands. But ask the animals, and they will teach you. Or the birds in the sky, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. Or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. You see it from the very beginning, and you see it go through all the way to the very end in Revelation, that the purpose of creation is to glorify God. 
Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. We have been given the gift of stewardship, not ownership. All creation is God's and was created to give God glory. I go to the East Coast for studies. I'm gone for a week, and I've got two cats at home. This last time, it actually just worked out that I had a friend call me and say, I have a conference down in San Diego. Would you be willing for me to, to, would you be happy to have a guest? And I said, actually, this is working out perfectly. Would you be happy to house sit? Because I won't be there, but I need someone to look after my cats. And so she came, and I was excited to have somebody there. I said, please, the fridge is full of food. Please eat the food. Please, please open the windows. Enjoy the garden. Enjoy it. And imagine my disappointment if, if, if I had come back and she hadn't eaten any of the food and it had rotted and she'd never used the garden. I would have been sad. But imagine my heartbreak if I came back and the house was wrecked and all my things were broken and my cats were dead. She was a steward. She is not the owner. People have sometimes said, there's no need to worry about this created world as it's all gonna burn up anyway. But that's what people said about the body. Either way, we don't get to decide. It's not up to us. Creation is God's. We've been given the job to be good stewards. And the management of this world is not for our own benefit in mind, but the management is with the mindset that this is the Lord's world. How do we manage it in a way that honors the whole world, our bodies, our creation as God's? I'm going to invite um, our praise leaders up to sing, Take My Life and Let This Be. Throughout this series, we've spoken about stewardship and the idea that everything is God's and we've been entrusted with the responsibility on God's behalf. We think about what does it mean in this topic for God to come back, look us in the eye and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. As we sing these words, take my life and let it be, I'm inviting you to think about the ways in which God might be wanting each one of us to consider that we're just stewards of our bodies, of the world. How can we use our bodies? How can we celebrate the world in a way that honors God? Tomorrow morning, we can invite you to come at seven o'clock in the morning. If you notice on the back of your bulletin, you'll see that there's a hike and consider there. What does it look like to honor God? But I invite you to pray this prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to, to prompt you in whether it's for your own body or whether it's for the world, how God might be wanting you to be good stewards. Let us sing.